welcome to day three of Google Next. Thank you for attending the session about modernizing and migrating to cloud. My name is Ashutosh Tripathi, and I am the cloud customer engineer with Google Cloud. Co-speaking with me today is John Sherwood and Jonathan Lee from CBS Interactive. I would let them introduce as they come on the stage. I'll quickly touch upon why part of the cloud, why enterprises are migrating to the cloud. Can I get a quick show of hands? How many of you own your own power grid to supply electricity to your houses? Okay, I'm, as expected, I got only one hand, but as we know, owning our own infrastructure is not really a cost-efficient way to supply electricity to our houses. Similarly, enterprises are realizing that owning and operating your own data center is not really a cost eff efficient. Real differentiator comes what kind of products and services we deliver to our end customers. That being said, there are top four migration drivers for the enterprises of any size to migrate to the cloud. The top one being the growth. A lot of organizations are looking to release new products and services to serve their end customers. They want the tools and capabilities to react to the changing market conditions. And with the technology, you can serve your customer across the globe, whether they are sitting in Africa, Asia, or right here in North America. And the risk mitigation. Risk is not only about how do we prevent attacks to our system, but also meeting the compliance, regulatory compliance, whether it's around data residency or having a secured platform to serve our customers and build a reliable infrastructure to serve our applications to end customers in case of any natural disaster or calamity. And as you heard that Google Cloud has regions across the globe, that way you can bring your applications and services closer to your end customers and have a reliable and fault-tolerant architecture for your applications. Innovation is one of the key drivers Customers are looking to move to the cloud. The way the, all these technologies, whether it's around artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, the cloud provides. It is not only helping enterprises to explore new frontier to serve their customers, but also differentiate from their competition and build a reputation as a forward-looking organization. While doing all this, cost is also one of the most important factors. Cloud provides various productivity tools, the automations, capabilities, and also let you have the infrastructure based on your varying demands, whether it's a peak or off-peak, you can set accordingly and choose the financial model that works best for the organizations. Now, uh, cloud is not only about innovation and disruptions. It's also about how organizations are transforming. They are evolving to have a applications or the environment which can serve the whole ecosystem, their customers, their employees, their partners. And there are typically four stages. First is the divest. As I mentioned, the owning and operating inf your infrastructure is not the key differentiator for most of the organization. Make it someone else's problem. Make it Google's problem to run your infrastructure efficiently, securely, and reliably all that at a lower cost. Invest in the areas which help you differentiate, whether it is around artificial intelligence or machine learning, and Google has been doing it for many, many years. Let us help you make you successful. Empower your developers with the tools and the capabilities and the platform so they can build the exciting applications to drive the customer engagement, help your employees be more invested with the business and grow your partners. And overall, all this transformation comes around three things, the right culture, the right technology, and right processes. Even the large organizations are realizing that size is advantage to them, and they're looking to transform how they do business and how they serve their customers. At a very high level, the infrastructure, infrastructure modernization can be said, how do we have a secured, performant and reliable architecture and the platform at a lower cost. It could all start with the compute, which is 
the first journey to many of the organizations, whether you are looking to build new applications using serverless technologies, or you're looking to migrate your applications to the cloud, whether it's for disaster recovery, or hosting any of your uh, custom applications such as SAP and others. The storage. Many of the organizations, whether they are in the media and entertainment space or in healthcare, financial services, and many other, they have a lot of data sitting on the tape. At Google, we provide the different type of storage which works best based on the type of media you are looking to move or content you are looking to move to the cloud. Network, as you heard Sundar saying that we have laid out the fabric under Pacific and looking to do under Atlantic as well. Network is the key no matter what we do, whether we are connecting to on-prem, uh, to cloud, or having a hybrid architecture, or also providing services to our customer. Or we are doing some specialized tools around AI, ML, and everything. So it's all about highly scalable, highly reliable data center, or the capabilities in the cloud, what Google Cloud provides, actually. So, just quickly, the quick question comes to everybody's mind, hey, how do I start? So it starts with how do you assess your applications, what type of applications you have in the portfolio and what they are doing. And other thing comes about planning your uh, application, planning your move, the dependency. There are some applications which may be cloud ready, but there are some which may not be even ready for the cloud. So plan your order and pick a path, whether it is migrating or lifting and shifting or re-architecting your applications. And while doing this, how do you optimize your applications and operations and have a constant feedback loop to get started and optimize your journey? We have large number of customers who are modernizing and migrating to GCP. And it's my privilege to invite John Sherwood, VP of Engineering from CBS Interactive, to share his journey. John. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Oh, clicker. Hold on a second. When we started CNET in 1995, it was all about helping thousands of people get the most from their computer. Here at CNET, we've been testing Windows 95 for some time. It's new, it's different. Then came the internet. You've got mail. HDTV and the smartphone. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. The world had officially gone digital. Since then, CNET has helped hundreds of millions of people master a connected life. Do it yourself tech. Hey Siri, close the shades. Okay, let's actually start with what we do know. Let's check out what it can do. How to kit proof your streaming services. When there's massive change, market confusion, and untapped opportunity, you'll find CNET making tech make sense. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm John Sherwood, uh, Vice President of Engineering and Technology for the CNET Media Group, uh, part of CBS Interactive. Uh, we're gonna talk today about our journey uh, to GCP, which we completed last year. Uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about our migration at a high level, and then Jonathan Lee, Director of DevOps, is gonna come up. He's gonna go into some details and then take you through a demo um, of a system that the team built to uh, replay our traffic before we actually sent uh, production traffic into GCP. Uh, first off, a little bit of history about CNET. Uh, we were actually founded in 1994 uh, as a television, um, com uh, we were producing television shows uh, about technology, quickly pivoted to the web in uh, 95. Um, in 19, sorry, in 2000, uh, CNET acquired ZDNet to form CNET Networks. Uh, I am proud to say that I actually wrote the code for that uh, page there on the right. Uh, I know what you're thinking. Um, yes, Ziff Davis did hire children to write code back then. Um, so CBS Interactive uh, was, uh, CBS bought CNET Networks in 2008 uh, to form CBS Interactive. CBS Interactive is a collection of all the brands you see there, and there's actually a, a lot more that I couldn't fit on the slide. Uh, with more than 350 million uh, visitors each month to our uh, properties, we are the 14th largest uh, property in the world, and we're the seventh largest uh, in the US. Um, just to give you some uh, perspective, uh, the top five include the likes of Microsoft, Amazon, Google, uh, I should have said Google first, uh, Facebook. So we're in uh, good company there. 
Um, CNET Media Group that my team is responsible for is the majority of the non-CBS brands. And uh, we decided to start our journey with CNET, uh, which is actually the largest brand of that portfolio, uh, mainly because it uh, had a relatively modern stack that we were working with. We had gone through a, uh, a modernization a few years before. This is what, uh, I put this up here, it's kind of an eye chart, I just want to kind of show you. When we said we were going to move CNET into GCP, this is what we were dealing with in the beginning. Uh, but, you know, basically it's a PHP web app uh, fronted by a CDN proxy. Uh, behind that is Varnish. Um, and then we have uh, APIs. Uh, behind that is Mongo, Solar, MySQL. Uh, and then we have Java applications that are doing the processing for big data. Uh, bringing in our product catalog and pricing information. Um, so while our journey actually started a little less than two years ago, uh, CBS Interactive has actually been in the cloud for uh, probably more than a decade with some of its properties. Um, so there has been some experience there, um, and not all of it's been good. Uh, a few brands went in several years ago only to be pulled out pretty quickly once we got the sticker shock of how expensive it was to run. Um, but that tipping point uh, passed a few years ago, um, and uh, now uh, it's much more cost effective uh, and efficient for us to run in the cloud. Um, uh, we, yeah, so I'll move on. Uh, so just quickly getting in here, uh, of course, there's the operational efficiencies. Um, we can spin up uh, servers and hardware uh, within a matter of minutes. Uh, we don't have to go through long procurement processes that we used to have to go through. Um, of course, uh, you know, we would always over-provision so we could handle our peak load, uh, but then we'd have a bunch of hardware sitting around uh, that we weren't using. Um, and we had to do a whole lot of guessing up front, you know, what we were going to need. Uh, so now we can quickly spin up what we need at the time that we need it. Uh, we can get prototypes uh, going really quickly. Uh, and then, of course, there's the cost efficiencies and transparency. Um, so we can actually see uh, and pay for what we're using. Um, before, we used to have this model where uh, we would pay for the costs of the data center and the teams that manage that by the number of servers we had running in the data center. So what happened was at the end of every year when they did that allocation, there was a mad scramble for everyone to shut down as many servers as we could so we wouldn't be left holding the bag. As Soon as that process was done, everyone would start up servers again and it'd be the Wild West. Um, of course, we want to be able to leverage managed services. Uh, we don't want to be, uh, as Ashutosh said, we don't want to be doing all of the, the core infrastructure. Uh, we want to be solving business problems uh, core to our business. Um, even though we're a very, uh, we've been around for a while, and so we have a history of having to build things ourselves, like CICD um, and uh, Search. We actually uh, developed Solar and released that. Um, but now we don't have to do that, and we don't really want to be doing that. Um, security, of course, uh, for a long time there was this mantra of, oh, the cloud is not secure. Um, that's not actually the case. It's just you have to uh, think about it in a different way. You can't just draw a nice ring around your data center. Uh, you actually have to think about the components and how you're going to secure them. Um, we could leverage Google's network, uh, their global network, and get really close and, uh, to our customers um, uh, much faster. Um, and uh, we also leveraged uh, Direct Connect uh, from our data center into um, GCP, uh, and that was really important for us as we uh, did our migration. Um, and then, of course, high availability, disaster recovery. Um, we were running in a single data center in Phoenix, um, so of course there's problems with that. If something happened, uh, core networking router or you know, something like that, it could take down uh, everything and take us a while to recover from that. Um, Google, we can spin things up in multiple zones and regions. I will admit, when we first launched, we actually went out in one region, one zone. We did like for like, and that was really just to kind of keep the scope of what we were trying to do uh, as small as possible. But soon after we launched, we uh, went multi-zone, uh, and that was uh, relatively quick and painless for the people who actually did the work. Uh, okay, so how do we do it? Um, I'll bring uh, Ashutosh's slide back up here. Uh, and we basically went through this process. We assessed uh, what our applications were doing, what our systems and infrastructure were. Uh, we planned what we could do, uh, what we could move and when we could move it, and looked at all the dependencies and complexity. 
Um, but we didn't want to wait too long. We wanted to get migrating because GCP was new to us um, and we knew that there was a lot that we probably wouldn't know and we were going to have to learn along the way. Uh, and then, of course, we optimized. Like I said, we went multi-zone uh, afterwards. Um, so we went to uh, set off to figure out what we were going to do, um, how we wanted to do it. Um, for each system, um, we came up with a design plan for each one. Uh, could we lever leverage managed services? Um, if not, did we have the expertise in-house to set up those systems and maintain them? Uh, for example, we didn't really want to set up and maintain our own Hadoop cluster, so we decided to uh, leverage Dataproc um, as a managed service. Um, but some of those decisions uh, required then some refactoring and had impact. Um, we knew we could containerize, run in VMs, so some of the, the things we wanted to do was uh, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, and then once we had a rough idea of the design, uh, we would uh, compare that with a straight lift and shift um, to see if you know, just doing a straight lift and shift was actually more cost effective. Um, but uh, I will say we were kind of morally opposed to doing just straight lift and shifts. We wanted to gain uh, some wins out of moving into the cloud um, and not you know, end up with the same thing uh, just in a different location. Um, while we were doing that, a broader steering group uh, was uh, solving these problems across CBS Interactive. And these were things that I didn't want my team to have to be responsible for, and quite frankly, they needed to be solved across the entire company. Um, how are we going to manage uh, users uh, and their access? Um, what was the networking going to look like? How are we going to connect to the data center? Um, how was the network going to be managed? Security, what were the policies? Uh, what were those going to be, and how were they going to be enforced? And then, of course, billing. How are we going to divide up uh, the costs and make sure that we did get the transparency that we really wanted? Uh, at a high level, this is what our project looked like. So as I said, we started with uh, design and architecture um, and uh, did that for a couple of months. Um, and uh, then uh, we decided, uh, as I said, some of our back-end systems were much more complex and were going to require uh, more thought and refactoring. Uh, so they were going to take a little bit longer. Uh, we knew our front end stack was uh, a little bit uh, simpler, and we could get that out uh, more quickly. Um, so we decided to break the project up into two phases. Um, and also, I'm kind of impatient, and I didn't want us to have to wait until everything was done uh, before we started learning. So that's why we went with two phases. Uh, the first phase was really all our front end reads, and uh, that allowed uh, traffic to come into those systems. Um, the writes stayed in our legacy infrastructure. Um, this also gave us the ability to uh, slowly ramp up traffic into the cloud um, so we didn't have to flip a switch, which was uh, very important to us. Um, so this is what the phase one architecture looked like. Uh, you can see there uh, on the right, uh, our writes were going into our legacy data center, um, and then our, our legacy uh, web apps were still serving traffic there from those data sources. We were replicating those data sources over into GCP through that Direct Connect. And then we had our containerized uh, applications sitting in uh, GCP. And then we used our CDN as a proxy to slowly ramp traffic up over to GCP. Um, over the course of a few weeks, we did that. Uh, and then we had 100% of our traffic running in GCP. Um, I, I'll put an asterisk there, it was almost all of our traffic, uh, all the reads. Um, so then we were able to, uh, when all of our backend systems were ready to go, then uh, we already had most of the traffic over there, so actually the, the launch went really smoothly. We were able to break replication, turn on those new write services to point at those uh, replicas that were now the masters, and uh, this is what we ended up with. Uh, doesn't this look way better than that first uh, graphic I showed you guys? Uh, then coming back to this, this is actually uh, phase 0.5. So this is our infrastructure set up before we started proxying traffic over. Um, we wanted a way to load test and do functional testing of that system. Um, so the team developed a, a, a replay system that could take our traffic um, using Stackdriver, Cloud PubSub, and Cloud Functions, replay our traffic in real time, um, allowed us to 
uh, dial that up and down, and we were able to actually, I think, run like 300% of our traffic over into the new system. So it really gave us a, a way to fine tune and configure our new system before any real users act actually had to experience it. Uh, and Jonathan Lee is going to come up and give you a demo of that. Um, so of course, this was a, a huge effort, um, and most importantly, a huge team effort, uh, and a ton of details that I haven't even gotten into. Uh, and Jonathan will start to get into some of those. Uh, it required a ton of focus, collaboration across my team, across CBS Interactive, with Google. Uh, we also had some partners that we worked with. Deloitte uh, provided some con contractors for us. Um, and uh, I'd like to say thank you to them. Many of them are in the room today, so thank you. Uh, one of which, who is a star student sitting in the front here, is Jonathan Lee. He's director of DevOps for the CNET Media Group. Uh, I'd like to bring him up and uh, take you through some of the details. This is one of the critical systems that makes CNET CNET. This is our, our catalog uh, backend system. So just wanted to call it out along with pricing, uh, which is a similar system. But both systems take advantage of a lot of managed services. So they're taking advantage of BigQuery, Dataproc, uh, App Engine for Crons, uh, preemptible VMs, uh, PubSub, and then Cloud Storage. So. And then building on top of that, uh, for our, our testing strategy, this is a front-end proxy. Uh, so this is where all the user traffic came in from our users. Uh, it came in through Akamai, where we did that traffic splitting that John covered. It hit uh, the Google load balancers that then proxied over to a Varnish uh, instances. The Varnish instances did not support HPS, so we had to use a, a leverage another open source product called Hitch. And what Hitch does is it just terminates the um, HPS and talks to Varnish over the box. And then from there, we can talk to the internal uh, swarm load balancers and then off to container land for our front end. So I want to talk a little bit about the infrastructure tooling. So one of the things we want to do during our migration to the cloud is to adopt infrastructure as a code. Um, that allowed us to do more automation. So we leveraged Jenkins and HashiCorp products. So Jenkin, Jenkins would talk to Packer and Terraform and provision our compute instances, and then Terraform would actually provision out those Packer images to our infrastructure. So we managed to standardize on Ubuntu as our base image. Uh, we had three flavors, uh, 1404 for our legacy applications, 1604 was what we tried to adopt for most of our newer applications and all of our Docker Swarm stuff. And then we started leveraging 18.04 as it got released. So jumping back to the security that John mentioned earlier, uh, we leveraged a lot of security in our infrastructure. Uh, we had Tenable, which basically just told us when we needed to patch the OS. Uh, we had Signal Science, that's basically set in our Nginx uh, and was the WAF for our applications. We had Aquasec that did uh, the container image uh, scanning, Vault, which kept all of our secrets, and then we also, which is not on here, uh, Sigital and Checkmarks, which also did um, static analysis of the code. So what did the security integration look like? So tying in all those security uh, tools, we had Tenable that would actually be baked into the packer without registering any of the uh, images that got pushed up to cloud storage. Terraform would actually push out those Packer images, uh, then registering those, uh, those VMs as they were spun up with Tenable. Then we had Signal Science running on the compute en engines inside the Nginx, and then obviously Vault uh, could be used for shipping any sort of secrets over to the VMs. For containers, uh, building on top of the last slide, we also leveraged Jenkins to push to our own private Docker registry which we just ran the open source Docker registry. Uh, we're in the process of moving over to GCR. Uh, so that's a, another managed service we're going to take advantage of. Uh, we use Nexus uh, to manage any sort of uh, artifacts. And then as Jenkins was pushing out those containers to Swarm during that build process, we would leverage Aquasec to do the image scanning to make sure they were in compliance. And then we also ran Aquasec Enforcer inside of the Swarm clusters, which could tell us if any of the containers were out of policy. <laughs> So as for Docker, uh, Docker services, 
Uh, most of our stateless applications were Dockerized, and we had a pretty standard setup where we tried to follow best practices, which is one process per container. So we had containers that ran the Nginx, and then those actually talked internally in the Swarm cluster over to PHP, Python, whatever other application languages we were running. <clears throat> so now I want to get into um, three of the things that are most critical for any cloud migration. Uh, and this should be useful for just about everyone. So the first one is logging. You have to have logging to be able to migrate to a cloud successfully. So before we started our GCP migration, we decided to integrate a lot of our tooling into uh, GCP before we actually moved any applications over. So we needed to get those logs from the on-prem data, data center into GCP. So we tried to leverage all of the tooling that was on the machines without actually editing any of them or adding any new software or anything like that. So for solar, for instance, we had our syslog running on the VMs inside of our data center. We just had those remotely ship those logs over to Fluent D boxes that were running in GCP. Those Fluent D boxes basically just proxied those over and authorized them with the GCP platform and then ship those over to stack driver logging. So, and then for container, containerized workloads, we leveraged another open source uh, logging driver called Logspout, and that effectively did the same thing uh, that our syslogs did, which just shipped the logs over to GCP. So once they got into GCP, got into stack driver logging, we now had visibility across our on-prem data center using GCP's stack driver uh, logging. So from there, we decided that, well, we need to get people on board with GCP. Uh, a lot of people haven't been trained on that, so we decided to leverage an, another uh, architecture. Uh, how many people know about the Elk stack? Okay, so for the people that don't know what that is, that's uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Uh, Logstash actually parses the logs, ships them to Elasticsearch, which stores them, and then Kibana is like a pretty GUI that sits on the front of it. So we, we shipped the, the stack driver logs over to PubSub. From there, that got, sh that got pulled from Logstash and then got ingested into that Elk stack. Once we migrated over to GCP, uh, fast forward a few months, uh, we were able to remove that uh, Fluent D dummy boxes and just ship straight into stack driver logging. So not much change there. So here we kind of have just the two logging systems. We have the stack driver logging that people were getting ramped up on, on how to use and leverage. And then over on the right, we had Kibana, which is a bit more uh, friendly to uh, new people coming into uh, logging. So we'll go over that a little bit in the demo. So after you have logging in place, uh, the next most critical thing is, is monitoring, obviously. So you need to know what your uh, systems are doing where the errors are coming in, uh, when you need to look at the logs and, and dig in. So we leverage quite a few open source products, uh, Prometheus being the, the big one, uh, so, and then Grafana for displaying uh, those Prometheus metrics. And then also with alerting, you need, you know, in the monitoring, you need alerting. So we had Node Advisor for the system level metrics that got shipped into Prometheus, C advisor for container level metrics, and then we had a black box exporter that can actually kind of work similar to Pingdom where it can just do a health check to uh, the application to make sure that they're still up. Uh, on the front end side, we didn't, we didn't really have to worry too much about front end performance, but we did still test it just to make sure that we weren't gonna impact end users. But we leveraged a couple other open source tools, one being Sitespeed.io, uh, and, and then that integrated with web page tests. So we ran those side by side comparing the front end performance of our legacy application and our GCP application. And then last but not least for uh, the front end, we also integrated with Akamai Impulse, which allowed us to get real user monitoring from the end users browsers uh, while we were doing that migration. So we could actually lay them side by side and we could see if there was any performance prob problems to our end users. So with all that in place, we decided that we needed to get more experience in GCP, so we decided to do table talk exercises. Um, 
And within those tabletop exercises, we could do anything from just stopping servers uh, to give people that operational experience of debugging and figuring out what's going on. Uh, bad code deployments, uh, thundering herd problem. How many people have heard of that? Uh, not many. One, two. Okay. So the thundering herd problem is basically just you, you stop all the traffic, and then all of a sudden you just send a bunch of traffic, like exponential amount of traffic. So we, we tend to have live events, things like CES and Black Friday and things like that. So we'll get a surge of traffic if you know iPhone gets released or something like that. So we wanted to test that scenario. So let's get into the uh, one of the testing strategies that we came up internally, which was the live replay uh, of production traffic. So we brainstormed this in-house after uh, evaluating with several external third parties and open source products. Uh, they didn't quite fit our, our needs uh, internally. We wanted to replicate live traffic, not just simply replay a percentage of a specific page or types of page or anything that's static like that. So uh, a lot of the open source tools allow you to replay things like an article page at 10%, uh, reviews pages at 70%. So it was very static, and you had to pass it a static list of URLs. So going back to that front end uh, diagram, we leveraged that front end uh, entry point for our replay test. And we, and we realized that all we had to do to test the entire system end to end is really just send user traffic like real users were coming in. So let's walk through uh, the system that we built internally. So obviously you have the, the end users there on the right talking to our legacy Phoenix data center servers. From there, uh, we're shipping those logs using our syslog or log spout over to Fluent D boxes in GCP. From there, they get ingested in stack driver logging. From there, PubSub. PubSub can actually kick off cloud functions. And then within the cloud functions, we actually had the ability to do any sort of programming or manipulation of those logs as they came in. So we could introduce errors. We could just dynamically just replay live traffic. Um, we could even uh, time box and replay certain logs if we wanted to. So. And then from there, the, the cloud function would actually uh, issue those HTTP calls over to the GCP boxes. So this is, entire system allowed us to dynamically replay uh, any sort of traffic coming into Stackdriver logging and replay it to a secondary system. So this is our just normal CNET.com. Uh, I pushed it up to CNET next. Um, so what we want to do is we want to leverage that sweet uh, retro CNET that John mentions earlier. So what I did is I pulled a retro.cnetnext.com. And what we're going to do is we're going to send traffic to this one uh, using those cloud functions. We're going to replay that traffic over to the retro system. So jumping over to the cloud console, you can see I've already pre-baked all the VMs. We have uh, the legacy swarm cluster that's running that uh, cnetnext.com. Then we also have a GKE cluster that's running the retro cnetnext.com. And then also I have a, a, a separate cluster just that's running tools, so Grafana, uh, the Elk stack, things like that. So reconnect to that. So here we got the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it's got four nodes in it, pretty standard stuff. Uh, jumping into one of the, the workers, we can actually look at the logs. So I'm going to hit play on that. So you can see I'm actually leveraging uh, another tool. Uh, it's similar to Siege or Vegeta, if anybody's familiar with those. What you can do with those is you can just send traffic directly to um, a, a system, and you can set a rate on that. And so we're, we're sending over traffic just in case we don't get enough hits. So from there, we can see those, those logs are coming in uh, to that legacy system. And actually, we can, we can actually see a few people actually coming in. But you can see that it's the actual Vegeta system, because it has the, the Go, Go HTTP client. And then from there, we can export out to PubSub. So we have a traffic uh, replay export that's shipping over to uh, the PubSub topics. 
Uh, just a note, if you do have exports out and you want to save a little bit of money, you can actually put in exclusions uh, on your, your logs so that they don't actually get stored into Stackdriver logging, but they will still get shipped over to PubSub. So we do that to save a little bit of money. It's disabled right now. So on the topic, we have the topic from the, the export from log, the Stackdriver logging. Uh, it has two subscriptions in it right now. Uh, if we jump over to that, one is actually shipping over to that cloud function, and the other one is actually getting pulled from uh, an elk stack that I'm actually running in that tools swarm cluster. So if we take a look over at those, uh, those tools workers, we actually have an elk stack running in there pulling those logs in real time. Put a refresh on here so you can see. So we can see those logs are coming in in real time, and what that allows uh, us to do for the developers is that this gives them an easy user interface for them to get up and running with uh, filtering logs. So they get these nice little buttons where they can include and exclude uh, different filters and, and track down any sort of issues. So jumping over to the replay system, so now we have uh, a cloud function that's actually getting messages from the logs. So you can see here we have that cloud function actually running right now. Uh, it's, it's, it's issuing about a 50 requests a second over to the new system. If we jump into the source code, I'm going to dive a little bit into the source code. The source code is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're using node 8 and using uh, request promises. So with those request promises, uh, we're setting up the domain, setting up the user agent. We can actually set a percentage uh, inside the node code and replay a certain percentage of that traffic that's coming into that legacy system. So here we have it set to 10%, um, and we're only replaying 10% of the 100% traffic that's coming into the legacy system. So down here we set up the, um, the request. We can put some headers on there. We actually change the user agent so we know it's coming from the traffic replay system. Uh, and then we can use the promises and catch those promises, whether it's successful or if it fails. So jumping over to the logs, uh, we can actually watch the logs from the cloud functions in real time. Uh, and we can see when the, the, the functions are executing and when they're, how long they're taking and that sort of thing. Uh, jumping back to the Kubernetes cluster, we can actually look at the services. Uh, we can see that CNET service that's running the retro site. And we can look at those stack driver logs from the new system. And we can see that cloud function is actually coming in in real time. So I'm going to jump over here and I'm going to change this real quick uh, from 10. So I'm going to edit the cloud function just so that we can see this here in a second. I'm going to change it to 100%. And I'm going to deploy that. So while that's going, it's going to change the replay traffic over from 10 to 100%. So we have our Prometheus instances running. That's capturing all of our <coughs> metrics. We have alert manager that we can actually fire off alerts out to uh, Slack or anything like that. Uh, I'm leveraging Unsee, which is basically a wrapper for alert manager that gives you a nice pretty GUI. Um, so it actually had the cluster actually throwing a few errors so we can just see what that looks like. And then Grafana. So Grafana is the uh, big thing here. We can actually look at any of the metrics across any of the legacy uh, clusters or the <coughs> Kubernetes cluster. So here we're looking at the Prometheus stats from the tools swarm cluster and we can make sure that that, that's healthy. Uh, we can look at the individual no Docker node swarm uh, elements. Oh. Let's switch over to the mic. <coughs> so, oh, okay. So, <laughs> We can, we can look at the swarm node, uh, the nodes themselves, and we can actually see the uptime of how long those hosts are running and any sort of system load or performance that was running on those. Same thing uh, for the swarm services. We can see how many uh, replicas are running inside of that swarm cluster. And then also over on the Kubernetes side, we can uh, look at Grafana dashboards for the CNET site, for that retro site, and see how many containers are running inside of Kubernetes. Uh, same thing 
uh, with Kubernetes or Swarm, you can actually start pulling in metrics and start calculating costs and build dashboards around that, which is, is pretty neat. Uh, and then finally, we can mash all that up together and we can create a, a replay dashboard that actually shows our Swarm cluster on the left and our Kubernetes cluster on the right, and we can actually watch it in real time as traffic is coming in. So as we scroll in down here, we can see on the Swarm we have the containers running. Uh, we can look at the container CPU, the individual containers in Swarm versus the individual containers in Kubernetes. Uh, below that, we can look at the actual host VM and look at the CPU usage across the host uh, VMs and then also the nodes inside of Kubernetes. Uh, in the middle, we can see how many requests are coming in per minute from the legacy system to the new system. And then as we change that uh, cloud function, we can see it uh, react in real time with those changes. And then below that, we can see uh, requests per minute per host. So we're actually connecting here over to the Elk stack that I'm running, and we're actually pulling the logs individually from the Elk stack and then displaying those on this dashboard. And then below that, <laughs> finally, we can actually connect to Stackdriver uh, monitoring, and we can actually pull metrics from those managed services as well. So here we're actually looking at the pub sub queue of unacknowledged messages and we can see if we're overloading the system with too many messages and obviously in this demo I am since I only have one VM running. So cool. So that's basically it. I'm can we jump back over to the slides I guess. Okay, cool. So what's next? I uh, just wanted to call out some of the tech that we actually used on CNET. Uh, the ones bolded here are all the tech we were able to use for the CNET migration. Obviously, there's a lot more that we can leverage with the managed services as we uh, move off running our own infrastructure and move over to Kubernetes and things like that. Um, so. And then here's a few of the upcoming uh, projects that we're going to be working on in 2019 uh, slash 2020. Uh, hopefully leveraging GKE, memory store, things like that so that we don't have to run our own VMs. So, and obviously uh, leveraging that traffic replay system that we just went through.